Hello, welcome back to Marathon Man, where I go through Doctor Who from the very beginning, and you join me as we hit our first bit of animation. So we've reached the final story of Doctor Who's first season and I am so grateful that the majority of that first season still exists. Uh, 42 episodes and only 9 are missing and 2 of those 9 are from this story. Now given that they were animated to uh, allow for a full DVD release that means we have got a tantalisingly nearly complete season 1 for our shelves. If you've, if you've got shelves. I'm of the age where I've got shelves. When I first watched this story, the animations didn't exist, so I've only ever seen them once before on my previous marathon. So I have to admit to being more familiar with the recons, but in whatever form they take, knowing how many episodes are missing overall, the fact that we've got an almost complete season one is something to be thankful for. I might be wrong about this, but I've always had the vague impression that popular opinion on this one isn't all that favourable. Now, if that's the case, then it's another example of how popular opinion and I do not tend to see eye to eye. Sure, there are times when I can raise my glass and I can clink it with popular opinions, but I mean, it does feel like our relationship is mostly spent bickering about Doctor Who. I loved this story on first viewing and I love it every single time I watch it. There is no doubt in my mind that it is season one's most underrated story. It might not be season one's best, but I do think it's the most underrated. When we begin, Ian and Barbara's desire to get home is addressed to further remind the viewer that they are essentially marooned out of time, but rather smartly, it allows them to discuss the possibility that they may be rather excited at the hint of more adventure. As, as if like traveling with the Doctor has whetted their appetites for it. I really like these characters, I'm really fond of them, and it's always welcome to pause for a minute and listen to them confide in each other about their rather unique situation. It also helps that we are once again in Earth's past. Now, history is the thing that Doctor Who does best at this point in its life, and as far as I'm concerned, it hasn't dropped the ball with it yet. The setting of the French Revolution is well chosen. It's a tumultuous period of history with lots of scope for drama. Sure, the Aztecs were bloodthirsty and barbaric, which placed the travellers in a lot of danger, but that was the way of Aztec society. The Doctor and company dropped in on the Aztec society as it was. This, however, is a society in turmoil for them to get mixed up in. Rather than merely having the backdrop to rely on, this has event. The principal cast all seem much more enthusiastic with this material than they did with the Sensorites, which is another reason why this story immerses me more than that one. And the second episode, Guests of Madame Guillotine, comes along to not just be my favourite episode title yet, but probably my favourite episode. It balances different tones quite deftly, I think. For example, the jailer trying to get Barbara to buy her freedom with sexual favours is resolutely not for kids. And even though it's all implied rather than explicitly stated, and even when you take into account Vassal from the Keys of Mariners, I think this is the darkest the show has gone by this point. You wouldn't have seen the dust that just went past. In contrast, the Doctor operating solo in this episode is such fun. His interaction with the boy who saved him from the fire is very sweet. He even salutes him with Mon Capitan, and that all brings out that avuncular side of Hartnell's Doctor that can quite often get forgotten about by pundits of the future when they praise his performance. A lot of the time, he's remembered as the grumpy one. But this sort of impish mischief, it's there from the very beginning. I must rescue my friends, he declares, and then strides off purposefully and single-handedly towards Paris with nothing but his walking cane. This is the hero continuing to emerge. This is further explored when he encounters the road workers. Plot-wise, it's a fairly unnecessary diversion, but it's supremely entertaining, not to mention satisfying, to give the Doctor such a defiant moment. Alright, so braining a bloke with a spade hardly chimes with the character we're familiar with, but in my opinion, that doesn't matter. We know of the Doctor, what we are shown at this point, and this is simply behaviour he hasn't grown out of yet. He's still very much the Doctor along the way though. When told, I suppose you think you're really clever, he responds with something just so utterly doctory. I suppose you think you're very clever. Well, without any undue modesty, yes. Hartnell steps it up even more when the Doctor masquerades as an officer. He's good value when he first shows up at La Conciergerie, but he seems to step up and knock it out of the park even more when he's playing the part in front of Robespierre at the beginning of episode four. 
It would be fantastic to see this scene, just to verify my suspicions that Hartnell is very much on form here. As I mentioned earlier, Hartnell's Doctor seems to be remembered as being irascible and crotchety above everything else when he actually imbued him with a lot of other qualities. When he's reunited with Barbara in this, it really brings out that impish side of him that for a while was really overlooked, but I'm glad is starting to get more appreciated nowadays. He put a lot of different facets into the Doctor, and that meant that each one of his successors could build on various aspects of the character. He is a far greater actor in the role than I think a lot of people give him credit for, and The Reign of Terror brings this home more than a lot of season one. As the story progresses, I still don't see anything wrong with its pace. There's plenty to keep me interested, such as joyous little moments like in episode 5, when Ian actually tells the truth of where he's from and how he got there to an incredulous interrogator. Which is a scene pretty much repeated, likely unintentionally, years later in season 2 of Star Trek Picard. Barbara, lovely Barbara, gets a lot to do in this story as well, when she angrily introduces Shades of Grey to both sides of the revolution upon hearing that Leon is a traitor, it only makes me love her more. The revolution isn't all bad. Neither are the people who support it. It's changed things for the whole world. And good, honest people gave their lives for that change. Well, he got what he deserved. You check your history book, Ian, before you decide what people deserve. It is an acidic rejoinder to her closest ally in these travels. Yes, she's clearly upset by Leon's treachery and death, but her humanity in seeing both sides is precisely why she is my favourite character in the programme. I'm so sick and tired of death, Ian. I never seem able to get away from it. Jacqueline Hill is absolutely fantastic every time a camera is pointed at her. Then there comes the twist when Lemaitre reveals himself to be James Sterling, the Englishman that Ian had been looking for. Now, the arrival of this moment is another in a line of many that makes me question why this story is rated so low. Now, maybe that twist is obvious to some people, but the first time I watched it, I didn't see it coming. When Ian and Barbara ham it up at the inn, it amuses no end. Barbara's French accent and forgetting to curtsy are wonderful little garnishes to the plot and excellent character moments. Hers and Ian's reactions to Napoleon Bonaparte showing up are realistic, and her laughing at the inevitability of it all is very relatable, especially as it follows on so logically from her experiences in the Aztecs. It also serves to highlight just how great William Russell and Jacqueline Hill are. Doctor Who's fairly broad parameters means they get to play comedy, they get to play drama, they get to play action, they get to play tragedy. Their skills are on full display. As the story concludes, Robespierre is shot through the jaw. Though off screen for obvious reasons, it's still a little ghoulish for what we think of as a family show at tea time. Regardless, it did happen, although perhaps not in the same way as depicted here, and I suppose is therefore justified as the show fulfills its educational remit, although loosely in this instance. Overall, this has been a relatively mature story for Doctor Who to tackle, and one which sweeps me up every time. It also rounds off the first season with an eighth story that feels just as distinct from its seven predecessors. No one story in that first season feels like any of the other ones. The Travellers return to the ship, and we are treated to a wonderful little speech with which to end story and season. There may have been a little bit of a blip towards the end of the last story, but 42 episodes down, I am raring to go for season two. Like, what a first season for a show. Hell of a way to make your mark. It's the Doctor freeing the road workers from the Overseer. Okay, it's brilliant, but once again, Susan is a little bit sidelined. So, out of five... Oh, it's a season one Hartnell historical. Did you see that coming? As ever, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed your time at the pleasure of Madame Guillotine, then you know how YouTube works. Please hit the like thumb. It really helps no end. And what are your thoughts on the Reign of Terror? Do you think it's an underrated gem as well? Or would you prefer to consign it to the Conciergerie? Let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you back here next time for a catch-up, recap, and overview now that the marathon has completed season one. And if you don't want to miss that, be sure to hit the subscribe button, clang the cloister bell, and I'll see you soon.